Hello everyone. Welcome to Controllers Tech. This is an update video for the last one, which covered the encoder in SDM32, using the simple GPIO pins. It was working fine, but as few users pointed out that it would have been better to use the timer feature. So this video covers the SDM32 timer in encoder mode basically, and I will use the same encoder here also. The first part of the video explains the encoder itself, and it's the same as the other video. If you have already seen the previous video, just skip to 4 minutes. So let's start with the encoder first. I have this encoder here, and it's rotary, as you can rotate the shaft. The shaft is free to rotate in either direction, as there is no limit on the rotation. It have 5 pins, but we are interested in the bottom 2 pins. The pin names do not justify their functions, so we will call the clock pin as pin A, and DT pin as pin B. The middle one is the switch, and it represents the push button on the shaft. That's it about the encoder, now let's see how it works. I got this GIF from the Wikipedia, and it shows exactly what happens. Think of the black region as ground, and white region as VCC. So it start with both the pins in contact with the white region, so both the pins are high. Now let's say we move the shaft clockwise. So the outer pin goes low, while the inner one is still high. Now the inner pin goes low, and both the pins are low. And now they are going back to high again. If we move it counterclockwise, the inner pin goes low first, then the outer one. And then they both goes back to high. This is the entire working. Basically, we just have to check which pin goes low first, and based on that we can figure out, whether the shaft moved clockwise or counterclockwise. Let's see one more time with the logic analyzer. Here I have connected the channels to the pin A, and pin B. Supply is 5 volts. Let's start this. Pay attention, I am rotating the shaft counterclockwise. Here we got the signal on both pins. Let's zoom in. We have some unwanted signals here, but we will take care of them in the code itself. Let's focus on the main part. As you can see here, the first pin goes low, and after some time, the second one goes low. Now I am rotating it in the other direction. This time the second one goes to low first, and after some time, the first one goes low. This is exactly what's shown in this animation. This is the entire working of this encoder, and we will use these pins to identify the direction of rotation. Now let's see the timer part. Here is the reference manual for F103 controller, and I am choosing the general purpose timers for this function. Here we have the encoder mode. You can go through this explanation, I'll just get to the point, and that is this particular figure. Here you can see, we have signal on the two different channels, as we have two outputs from the encoder. Notice that if the T1 goes to high first, and then T2, the counter will start counting upward. As long as both the signals have rise and fall, the counter will keep updating. But in case of a jitter, only one of the signals will change, 
and in that case, the counter will not update. And if the T2 goes to high before T1, the counter will start counting down. This will indicate that the movement is in opposite direction. Again in case of jitters, the counter will not update at all. This is pretty convenient considering what we did in the last video, to get rid of these jitters. Let's keep this in mind, and create a new project. I will be using the same F103 controller. Enable the external crystal for the clock. I have 8 MHz crystal, and I want the system to run at maximum 72 MHz. I am using timer 2 for the encoder. Here we will use the combined channels, and select encoder mode. You see the pins PA0, and PA1 got selected. Keep in mind that do not use any prescaler value here, or else it won't work. Let's keep the auto reload to maximum value, which is 65535. Encoder mode will be both T1, and T2, as we will be using two inputs. Let's change this to falling edge polarity, as you saw in the first half, that's how this encoder sends the signal. I tested it with rising edge also, and somehow it was working alright. Enable the timer interrupt, as we will perform this entire operation in the interrupt service routine. That's it, now click save to generate the project. Here I have the encoder connected with the pins PA0, and PA1. And it is powered by 3.3 volts. Let's start the encoder in the IT mode. Here we have the channel parameter, let's see what we need to input in this. As mentioned here, for two channels, we must use channel all. Now once the encoder sends the signals, the interrupt will be called, and we will use the input capture callback for the ISR. The encode mode is the input capture in a way. Here we will go one step at a time. Let's start with reading the counter value only. Some people have confusion with this HTIM. Actually, since we are calling this function inside the ISR, so whatever timer have called ISR, the same timer handler will be used here. That's why I prefer to keep it this way. Let's test this much part first, and see what counter values do we get. I am rotating the encoder in clockwise direction, one click at a time. The counter increased by 4. Second click, and it is 8 now. Now there are totally 5 clicks and the counter is 20. This means the counter is increasing 4 counts per click on average. Now I am rotating in counterclockwise direction, and again one click at a time. You see, the counter is decreasing in counterclockwise direction, just like it's mentioned in the manual. Also the 4 counts per click is quite persistent. I can't say for sure, but maybe that's why it's shown 4 counts here also. Anyway if you try this, and find that the counter is not increasing by 4 counts, let me know in the comments. I tried with other MCUs that I have, and it was always 4 counts. This is fine, but there is one more thing, if the counter goes below 0, it will underflow, and start from the auto reload value again. We need to tackle this situation, 
and to do so, I am defining a signed 16-bit integer. Now we will typecast the counter, and store the value in this variable. Let's check the result. Now the things are working fine, you can have the negative values if you want them. Still we are getting 4 counts per click, and I would prefer the number of clicks over the count. Let's create another variable, position, and this will just be count divide by 4. This way for every 4 counts, the position variable will be updated. Notice the movement is clockwise, and the position is increasing. Also the position is around one-fourth of the count value. And now a counterclockwise movement will decrease the position. This is very easy to deal with, and the results are very accurate too. I just want to add one more thing here, and that's the speed. I haven't tested this part properly, so I can't say that it will work for sure. But it seems pretty okay to me, and you can see how I am approaching it. In this case, we will do the calculations in the interrupt file. The position is defined in the main file, old position is of course the old position data, Speed is also defined in the main file, and index is to keep track of milliseconds. The SysTick handler is called every one millisecond, and inside it we will update the index variable. Once the 500 milliseconds have passed, we will calculate the speed. You can reduce this time, if you want more frequent updates on speed. Speed is basically be how much difference is there in the old and new positions, in one second. I am multiplying by 2, because this code will be executed every 500 milliseconds, and therefore it will give speed every 500 milliseconds. But we want it every second, so the speed into 2. This will give us the speed in clicks, like how many clicks per second. We will then update the old position, and reset the index. You can convert these clicks to RPM or something, based on how your encoder works. For me, I have found out that it takes 20 clicks per revolution. This should be 16-bit integer here, that's how it's defined in the main file. Let's see the working now. Let's start it slow, the speed is around 20 clicks per second. And now I am going faster, and the speed is around 70 clicks per second. We have speed in the negative direction also. I would say this is pretty good. Like I said one revolution takes around 20 clicks, and I think I am making around 3 and a half revolutions per second. As I mentioned earlier, I am not sure if this is correct, so if someone can test and report, or if anyone is willing to work on it, feel free to contact me. This is it for this video. I hope explanation was okay, and you understood the timer in encoder mode. You can download the code from the link in the description. 
leave comments in case of any doubt. Keep watching, and have a nice day ahead.